Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Showcast, a series of podcast conversations from film festivals and film markets everywhere, presented by The Film Verdict. My name is Matt Micucci, and I'm coming at you today from the 2023 Berlin International Film Festival. Today, I share with you my conversation with James Benning, one of the most important American formalist avant-garde filmmakers of all time. His lengthy and distinguished career goes back to the early 1970s, and over the years, he has also been a frequent guest of the Forum and Forum Extended section of the Berlinale. This year, he presented a new film in Berlin called Allensworth, shot in the first municipality of California to be governed by African Americans. I was able to catch up with James Benning for a conversation about this latest work and more. So fire up an audio teeny and listen to the audio waves as they fly through the air. This is the Showcast. Joining me at this time is James Benning, uh, right here in Berlin. So uh, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to Berlin as well. Yeah, thank you. I should say, <laughs> yes, I'm, I should say welcome back to Berlin because you've been here plenty of times and you seem to have a, a special relationship or bond with, with Berlin. Am I right in, in saying that? Well, I've been coming here since 78 when my first film, feature film played here. So uh, I've developed a quite a good audience here over the years. Uh, when the first film played, uh, about two-thirds of the audience left, and then that film was uh, remade, or, or repurposed, or whatever you call it, uh, about four years ago, and show it again as a, in a 35 millimeter uh, edition of it, and it was sold out and no one left, so my audience is, uh, has caught up with me. Yeah. <laughs> But do you feel like, uh, you know, I, I mentioned a special relationship with Berlin, but at large, I think Europe seems to really connect well with your works. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, well, mainly Berlin and, and Vienna is where I hang out a lot. So people know my work here much better than the U.S. and I have much better audiences here. Yeah. And, and just, just to complete kind of my triptych of questions about Berlin, because you mentioned yourself, you were here, you know, in the late 70s, the first time, 78, you said. And, uh, and obviously Berlin is one of those cities that's just been through a lot since then. And uh, how has that experience of coming back here changed for you? Has the city kind of, you know, had any significant alterations that have sort of impacted you as well? Well, I I first came here on my honeymoon in 1966 and went through Checkpoint Charlie and walked down Frederikstrasse when it was all bombed out and uh, uh, it was a completely different city. And now, uh, and then once it uh, it became this island city, a lot of money was flaunted in here from the West to show uh, Western culture in the middle of a communist section of of Eastern Europe. And now it's a, a, a great model of gentrification uh, with that's happened and what's happening around the world. So um, it certainly has an incredible history and, and uh, um, both a positive and negative one, of course. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I understand that you kind of live far from the big cities when you're not in big cities, perhaps presenting your work. Is that is that still the case? I lived in New York City for eight years, uh, and I've lived in Chicago and places like that, but I've also lived in a hunting cabin in upstate New York and on a cattle farm in Missouri, and now I live in a very small town uh, Valverde, uh, just north of Los Angeles, that was started by black people in the 30s. Uh, it's a similar kind of town as uh, Allensworth is. Yeah. yeah, let's talk about Allensworth, because of course that's the, the film that you are screening in, and, uh, here, and uh, I was telling you before we started recording, it's, uh, it's incredibly popular. I know people who can't get tickets to it, which is, which is great. Uh, but yeah, can you tell me a bit more about this, uh, this film? Um, well, Ellensworth is a, really a document of a, of a town that was started in 1908 in the Central Valley in California. And the Central Valley is a uh, farming valley that, that uh, feeds about a quarter of America, so it's large corporate farms. And in 1908, 
a group of black people from Illinois decided they wanted to start what was then called a race town where black people would manage their own lives and live outside of the kind of apartheid that was happening in America uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, so it was a place to establish their own their own government and, and their own way of life outside of Jim Crow laws. And, and what is it about this place that, that interested you? Well, it's, it's in uh, Tulare County, and I also live in a, uh, I have a cabin up in the mountains at the other end of Tulare County. And at that place, I had uh, rebuilt uh, the cabins of Thoreau and Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and it became a rather large art piece and site-specific, and it also generated three films and a number of, of paintings and sculptures and things like that. So I, I, I live in that county, too, and then I discovered that Allensworth was at the other end of my county and that it was this very interesting town. And it also, uh, it, it, I hate to tell this because it kind of ruins the film, um, and uh, the town itself collapsed due to white racism, and so that's what interested me. Uh, uh, and so I wanted to uh, make a, a film that would draw attention to the town and the racism that killed it. Yeah. Is that in reference to the poem that's read in, uh, at, at about the halfway mark? Well, the, the, the poems, there's two songs and there's a list of poems that are, are read in the film that are actually references to bl other black histories that kind of give you a hint as to what happened to Allenstown, uh, Allensworth, excuse me. I'm still waking up. <laughs> <laughs> so am I a little bit. Uh, but yes, I, I, I did mention I, I, I love the film, and uh, it's, it's, an, it's always a great experience for me to watch your, your films, because really, it seems like your style is, is so much different from whatever is, you know, happens Every anywhere else, and it's a style that you've kind of, you know, you've established and you feel comfortable in, right? And over the past, over the course of your your career, does it have a lot to do with documentations of things that might disappear? Well, it, partly that, but I think it's my films more about how we understand things from paying attention, and to pay attention, it's a function of time, and not as function of short time, but of uh, an investment in time. Uh, and so most of my films come from that point of view. They want to look at something and they want to look at something deeply and also listen to something. Uh, so by, by observation, uh, uh, hopefully you, uh, you gain some kind of insight. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always kind of wanted to ask you, uh, when did you get that first urge to pick up a camera? Oh, it's a funny story. When I was about 15, I was, we had just gotten a TV set, and that was in 1958. And there was a, a cooking show on, and I wa would watch that. And after that, uh, my Darren's Meshes of the Afternoon came on just out of the blue. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's so different than anything that I've ever experienced in a, in a movie theater and it wanted it made me want to buy a camera not to make a film like hers but to try to make a film that would would be my uh, understanding of uh, how one learns about things and so 12 years later I bought a camera after seeing that yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it didn't happen immediately what, what camera was it do you remember yeah it was a um, I bought it in um, Denver Colorado I was doing organizing at the time and there was a conference of organizers from around the US that were getting together to talk about what kind of uh, progress they were making and and mainly in poor neighborhoods in the US and there was a break, and I walked down the street, and uh, I found a camera store, and it had a uh, eight millimeter Bolex camera that looks exactly like the 16, but it was regular eight film where you put in a 25 foot load and shoot it, and then turn it around and shoot it again. And they would split it in half and 
it would become eight millimeter then. So yeah. it's that old process. Yeah. So at the time you were already like, let's say, politically active for yes, one time. I was very politically active at the time, and I took the camera back. I was doing organizing in Springfield, Missouri at that time, and I thought I cannot make a film here because if I want to make politic do things politically, I should just stay here and work at the grassroots level, which was starting to consume my life at that time and I was only 25 or 6 years 25 years old and I really had no idea what my life was and I was feeling I can't leave this but if I don't leave it I will not never find out who I am and so eventually I, I, I uh, started to do other things and that's when I started using the camera do you, uh, do you see your films as political films? Well, when I first started making, I thought I can't make political films because if I wanted to do politics, I should go back where I came from, you know, do, doing it at this grassroots level. But because I was so politicized from that work, it was impossible not to have that kind of political thinking resurface in my work. So. I do think of them as political, but I don't think them as being dogmatically political where I tell you what to think. I'm asking you to think about something. And, uh, uh, of course, I give hints to, as to what I think, but uh, I certainly don't want to uh, tell you what to do. I think some, some people have referred to your films as, as cinema that theorizes itself, something along those lines. Do you, would you agree with that statement? Well, that's a great compliment because I think uh, to, to make theory is much more interesting than to copy theory and to make examples of, uh, of theory. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, um, and not, not something that I say is... Uh, drives me forward but it certainly if I wasn't doing that I probably would stop and I'm also curious uh, as a as a kid maybe even just going back in time did you go to the movies a lot like you know just watch and then you know more conventional films that's it well I, I came from a lower middle class background and my mother would take my brother and I to see cowboy movies on Saturday afternoons and to see if Rocket Man would get out of the last episode where he was trapped in some precarious position uh, but I never uh, I don't watch many films I, I eventually went back to school I have a master's in math and then I went back and studied film and uh, uh, so I, I watched a lot of film at that time but and now I get to see one or two films when I go to festivals, and I'm somewhat aware of what's going on, but I'm, I'm not a, a cinephile at all. Right, right, right. You're more involved in what you're doing at the, at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a couple of things, too. I mean, you, I, I, I'm aware of your, your cabin uh, work, too, and uh, you know the, how it's inspired by Thoreau, and, and I wondered about that influence. Has that influence always been there, Walden and uh, you know, his works? Um, I think I've, I had that mindset before I read Walden, uh, but I certainly uh, reacted to it positively when I did. When I was young, I had an uncle that would take my brother and I and his his son out camping and, and walking. And, uh, and from that, I kind of developed this um, idea of, of having fun and, and learning at the same time. You know, I feel like I keep doing that today. And while I was watching Allensworth, actually, I, this thought occurred to me that... Uh, you know the shot, the shots in this film, and then I went back and also thought about your other works too. They kind of brought to my mind uh, Edward Muybridge. Are you familiar with his photography? Sure. Um, I'm not sure how that would fit with me because he's really uh, studying motion, uh, um, and I, I suppose I'm studying motion in a much more subtle uh, effect. I'm. I'm uh, one can see how trees, leaves move, and he's he's looking how horses get off the ground with three at least three legs at a time or yeah. whatever. 
I think that that uh, that was the main difference actually is that your camera is there before really anything enters the picture and if it does it's like a real thing that happens whereas his his films were were intentional but I was also thinking about his earlier life before he started experimenting and he would uh, take all these landscape shots of you know parts of uh, America the the frontiers that you know seemed unexplored and maybe disappearing and and also some of his life too I guess I was also thinking about <laughs> it's really interesting yeah <clears throat> I should know much more about him because a colleague of mine Tom Anderson made a beautiful film about Moy Bridge and I've seen it a number of times but not recently uh, but yeah um, I don't think I relate to him as strongly as maybe you are saying or Tom certainly uh. yeah yeah uh, I- I understand that you, uh, a few years ago, uh, taught yourself how to paint, too. Is, is that true? I, yeah, I, um, after I bought this land in the Sierra Nevada and I repurposed uh, the, ca- the house that I bought, I decided, well, what will I do here now after I did nine months of construction? And I thought, well, I always wanted to learn how to paint, and I, I'll... Re- try to learn how to p- paint by copying different uh, outsider artists that I really like. And it turned out that I, I did learn how to paint from doing that, but I learned more about how, how maybe deeper of what those artists' lives were about through the gestures that I had to repurpose from, uh, from looking at their work and to figure out what process they did to uh, make something. So, for instance, Bill Trailer, who was a huge black man and did these intricate uh, paintings on the streets of Alabama, I found that when he would place an uh, image onto a work, that if I didn't do it exactly the same, I wouldn't have the power of the off- the, of the negative space around that painting, and that he was really he really knew space and then I thought well he was a farmer his whole life and uh, he did contour plowing so he wasn't what they were calling as an unskilled artist he was very skilled and he brought a different profession to you know the way he dealt with space so, so I wouldn't have learned that without doing it myself to understand uh, how how he um, how he how he positioned an image onto a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard. Yeah. Thinking back to uh, when you started, uh, you know, making films. You, this is something that you mentioned before, but I wanted to go back to because I find it very interesting. Do you think that uh, you know, being a filmmaker and making those the films that you do has helped you see the world in a different way? And has that worldview changed over the years? Yeah, that's a big question. Uh, Certainly, the world has changed over the years. Uh, it's uh, it's gone from uh, practical uh, governments that should be more practical to kind of corporate rule. So I, I, mean, I certainly feel that. Um, but you had a different. I lost the beginning of your question. Has making films kind of uh, contributed? Yeah helped you see things in a different way or encourages you to see things in a different way? Yeah, I mean, mainly it's made me understand that you have to uh, look deep to find something out. And so it's given me uh, oh, the, the, um, the practice to be able to st- stay focused and to, uh, to look at something over time and not to be afraid of... Uh, having to take time. Do you think it's becoming increasingly difficult to stay focused in these times? I'm, I'm thinking as well of, you know, uh, the rise of new technologies of the past few years and how they kind of changed lives at large. Yeah, I don't own a so- cell phone and I was afraid of that, say, uh, that I would totally get addicted to it and I see people are totally addicted to their phones and that it's causing a new way of writing, a new language of shortcuts and, and uh, uh, really a loss of kind of an elegance uh, um, and, and, and causing uh, attention spans to get 
shorter and shorter where I'm trying to make mine longer and longer. Yeah. So I, I think um, we really need to study the psychology of, of this, of the new technical society, you know, and what it's happening to people. Have you, you've never owned a cell phone at all? No, I still don't. It gets, and it's almost impossible to live with one now, but maybe that's why I'm fighting to... Uh, but you do engage with technology, let's say, you know, you, you're quite, you know, with computers. I mean, in fact, you, you've always sort of been interested in that, in computer. Yeah, I, I um, studied math and I uh, learned how to program a computer in the early... Uh, 1970s when it was Fortran language and so I was interested in it to that extent now but now uh, I mean software drives me nuts because I I don't want to learn it and uh, yeah. I, I learn want to learn just enough what I need to know to get by and right. it takes it takes up too much of my time to yeah. and then you get to learn a, like uh, Final Cut Pro is a great editing software and then it, it disappeared and now I'm trying to learn yeah. another one and what are you using these days I'm I'm using Premiere because it uh, was similar to Final Cut Pro 7 but uh, I'd like to learn Da Vinci and uh, be more about color correction but I find out that I I'm trying to make films the simplest way so I don't have to uh, go so deeply with re repositioning the film through technology. I want to get the image from the camera rather than having to make it afterwards. So, so I take it you're not interested in, in engaging with uh, artificial intelligence all that much? Yeah, no, I, that kind of scares me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the scary thing is it's, it's, it's becoming part of the, the, the film festival lingo too, which I, I, I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll have to see, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There's a new world upon us for sure, and it's always been that way. So thinking of that, you know, again, going back to Allensworth and your other films is the political aspect, but do you also think that they work as an antidote against the tumultuousness of the times we live in? Like it could just work as a film that people go to see to escape, yeah, I'd hate to have it just be that, though. That would be reducing it to kind of medicine, and uh, I want it to be uh, more engaging than uh, being tranquil and, and putting you to sleep. <laughs> you know, it's remarkable because uh, we, we talked about uh, you didn't get, you, you know, you're still tired, you're a bit tired this morning, but you do so many things with your life and, you know, you don't, you don't have a phone, but it doesn't matter because it seems like you are, a, 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 by today's standards, a smartphone. <laughs> you know, you're kind of here and there always being creative. So silly question to end the, uh, the interview with. How, how many, m many hours do you need of sleep a night to stay fresh and excited and creative? I, um, I sleep eight hours a night and I, um, it's necessary. I work very hard. I get up early. I get up at around 6, and I generally get three or four hours of work in before I have to deal with anybody. So I can be very efficient that way. Uh, and then by 10 o'clock, I'm tired enough to go to go to sleep. So I think uh, it's important, at least for me, to get a good rest. And I've been lucky that I don't generally have tr uh, trouble falling asleep and uh, getting a good night's sleep. Does it ever, considering all the things that you do, does it ever become too much and do you do anything to have a, some type of balance in your life? No, because I, part of my philosophy is what I'm doing I want to do and I want to not, not to make it into entertainment, but I want it to be enjoyable, you know. Right. And I I don't do things that aren't enjoyable. Like I I um, when I'm teaching now, I refuse to to be part of what's happening in teaching. I won't. I never use the syllabus. I want to be free and creative when I enter the classroom. Yeah. And so, um, do you like teaching? I love teaching. Yeah. yeah. What's what's the, what's the, in your opinion? You know the definition of a a film educator in 2023. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just I tried to find uh, the students that seem to be 
serious about what they're doing, and I try to give them some kind of guidance and not try to make them into a, a mo another monster like me, but to <laughs> find their own their own place, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much for listening and look forward to more episodes of the Showcast from the 2023 Berlin International Film Festival and the European Film Market. Also, don't forget to revisit some of the episodes of the Showcast that have already been uploaded. We've got some really great stuff for you to sink your ears into. Till the next time, this is Matt Makucci signing off. See you soon.